Defeat and Death of Catiline While these events were taking place at Rome, Catiline combined his own contingent of troops with Manlius' original force to form two legions, allotted as many men to each cohort as his numbers permitted. Afterwards, as volunteers or confederates arrived, he drafted them in equal numbers into the cohorts and soon raised the legions to their full strength, although to begin with, he had not had more than 2,000 men. But only about a quarter of the whole army was equipped with regulation arms. The rest carried whatever weapons they happened to be able to get, hunting spears, lances, or even sharpened stakes. On the approach of Antonius's army, Catiline kept to the mountains, moving his encampment now towards Rome, now towards Gaul, and giving his enemy no chance of engaging. He hoped soon to have a large body of troops, if his supporters in Rome succeeded in carrying out their plans. So he refused the help of the slaves who at first flocked to him in large numbers. He was confident that the conspirators could muster enough men and thought it would be prejudicial to his plans if people saw that he had admitted runaway slaves to a citizen's movement. However, when news reached the camp that the conspiracy at Rome had been discovered and that Lentulus, Sethagus, and the others mentioned above had been put to death, the majority of his followers, who had been attracted to the campaign merely by hope of plunder or desire for revolution, dispersed in all directions the remainder Catiline withdrew by forced marches through rugged mountains to the neighborhood of Pistoia, intending to escape secretly by side roads into Gaul. But Quintus Metellus Seller was waiting with three legions in Picenum, since this was precisely the course that he suspected Catiline's difficult position would lead him to adopt. Accordingly, when Metellus learnt from deserters of his enemy's march, he quickly moved off and encamped at the very foot of the mountains which Catiline would have to descend in his hasty retreat to Gaul. Antonius also was not far behind. Considering that the size of his army compelled him to keep to comparatively level ground, while the enemy whom he was pursuing were lightly equipped for rapid flight. When Catiline saw that he was shut in between the mountains and the enemy armies, that things at Rome had gone against him, and that he could not hope either to escape or to be relieved, he thought his best course in the circumstances was to try the fortune of war, and decided to engage Antonius as soon as possible. He therefore assembled his troops and addressed them. I am well aware, soldiers, he said, that mere words cannot put courage into a man, that a frightened army cannot be rendered brave, or a sluggish one transformed into a keen one by a speech from its commander. Every man has a certain degree of boldness, either natural or acquired by training. So much and no more does he generally show in battle. If a man is stirred neither by the prospect of glory nor by danger, it is a waste of time to exhort him. The fear that is in his heart makes him death. However, I have called you together to give you a few words of advice and to tell you the reason for my present purpose. You know, I expect, what lack of energy and enterprise Lentulus showed, and how disaster it has been for himself and for us, and that by waiting for reinforcements to come from Rome, I have lost the chance of setting out for Gaul. Our present plight is as obvious to all of you as it is to me. Two enemy armies, one between us and Rome, the other between us and Gaul, bar our way. To remain any longer where we are, however much we might want to, is impossible, because we lack corn and other supplies. Wherever we decide to go, we must use our swords to cut a way through. Therefore, 
I counsel you to be brave and resolute, and when you go into battle to remember that riches, honor, glory, and what is more your liberty and the future of your country lie in your right hands, if we win, we shall be sure of getting all we want. We shall have plenty of supplies and all the towns will open their gates. But if fear makes us yield, everything will be against us. No place and no friend will protect a man whom his arms have failed to protect. Moreover, soldiers, our adversaries are not impelled by the same necessity as we are. For us, country, freedom, and life are at stake. They, on the other hand, have no particular interest in fighting to keep an oligarchy in power. Let these thoughts and the memory of your past valor inspire you to attack them with all the greater boldness. You might have lived dishonored lives in exile. Some of you could even have hoped to return to Rome. And, since all your property would have been confiscated, wait for the bounty of others to relieve you. Because such an existence seemed shameful and unbearable for men worthy of the name, you chose the course that has brought you to your present position. If you wish to escape from it, you must act boldly. No one but a victor can survive war to enjoy the fruits of peace. To hope for safety in flight after turning away from the enemy, those arms which are your sole protection is indeed folly. In battle it is always the greatest cowards who are in the greatest danger. Courage is like a wall of defense. When I think of you soldiers and consider what you have achieved, I have high hopes of victory. Your spirit, youth, and valor give me confidence, not to mention the fact that you are under the necessity of fighting, which makes even timid men brave. The enemy's superior numbers cannot encircle us in such a confined space. But if in spite of this fortune robs your valor of its just reward, see that you do not sell your lives cheaply. Do not be taken and slaughtered like cattle. Fight like men. Let bloodshed and mourning be the price that the enemy will have paid for his victory. When he had ended his speech, Catiline paused for a little. Then he ordered the trumpet call for battle to be sounded formed up his ranks and led them down to level ground. There, after sending away all the horses, including his own, so that the men might be encouraged by the knowledge that the danger was shared by all alike, he drew up his battle formation with due regard to the nature of the place and the quality of his troops. A plain was enclosed between mountains on the left and rough rocky ground on the right, here he posted eight cohorts to form the front, and grouped the rest in closer order as a reserve. From these latter he withdrew the centurions, all the picked men and veterans, and the best of the rank and file. And after seeing to it that they were well armed, placed them in the front line. He put Manlius in charge of the right wing, and gave the command of the left to an officer from Faisal. He himself, with his freedmen and some camp followers, took up his station beside the eagle, one which was supposed to have been carried in Marius's army during the campaign against the Cimbri. On the government side, since Antonius was prevented by an attack of gout from taking part in the battle, he entrusted the command to his lieutenant, Marcus Petrius who placed in his front line the cohorts of veterans which he had enrolled to meet the emergency with the rest of his army behind them as a reserve. Riding up and down, he addressed each soldier by name, encouraging them and bidding them remember that they were fighting against half-armed bandits in defense of their fatherland and their children, their homes and the altars of their gods, he was a good soldier, who for more than thirty years had served with great distinction as military tribune, prefect, lieutenant, and commander. And he knew many of the men personally, 
and remembered their gallant feats of arms. By recalling these, he kindled their fighting spirit. When he had satisfied himself on every point, he sounded the trumpet signal and ordered his cohorts to advance slowly, and the enemy's army did the same. As soon as they had come close enough for the light-armed troops to engage, the two armies raised loud shouts and charged together in mass. The soldiers threw down their spears and fought with their swords. The veterans, remembering their old-time valor, pressed the enemy vigorously at close quarters. They were bravely withstood, and a struggle of the utmost violence ensued, during which Catiline with his light troops went to and fro in the front line, supporting those who were in difficulties, summoning fresh men to replace the wounded, and attending to everything. Meanwhile, he fought hard himself and killed or wounded many of his opponents performing simultaneously the duties of a hard-working soldier and a good general. Petrius, when he saw Catiline resisting with such unexpected vigor, led the picked men who formed his bodyguard against the enemy's center, which, thrown into confusion by this attack and able to offer only a sporadic resistance, suffered heavy casualties. Then Petrius made flank attacks on both wings of Catiline's army. Manlius and the officer from Faisal fell fighting in the front line. Catiline, when he saw his army routed and himself left with a handful of men, remembered his noble birth and the high rank he had once held, plunged into the serried mass of his enemies, and fought on till he was pierced through and through. Only when the battle was over could the daring and ferocity with which Catiline's troops had fought be fully appreciated. Practically every man lay dead on the battle station which he had occupied while he lived. Only some of those in the center, whom Petrius's bodyguard had dislodged from their position, had fallen a little distance away. And although they had been forced back, they all had their wounds in front. Catiline himself was far from his own men among the dead bodies of his adversaries. He was still just breathing, and his face retained the look of haughty defiance that had marked him all through his life. Of that whole army which fought and fled, not a single freeborn citizen was taken prisoner. All were as careless of their own as of their enemies' lives. The victory of the government forces, however, was not gained without blood and tears. All the best fighters had either been killed in the action or come out of it badly wounded. Many who came from the camp to view the battlefield or to loot as they went about turning over the rebels' corpses found friends, relatives, or men who had been their guests or their hosts. Some also recognized the face of an enemy. Thus, diverse feelings affected all the army. Gladness and rejoicing were tempered by grief and lamentation.